the whole idea was we got to have a big transformation sequence in this movie, unlike anyone has ever seen before. <laughs> which is actually see the physical transformation happen. That was one of the reasons for making the movie as far as I was concerned. We had <laughs> told Afghan Embassy that we were going to do the first transformation scene with no cutaways and it was going to all be done on camera. The general technique for doing transformations prior to this movie was uh, lap dissolves and they would change the makeup over a period of you know hours and they would then dissolve all these pictures all these things together in the editing and that would turn him into a werewolf however he would have to stop moving but in in this case the idea was to take the makeup and actually change it with air bladders and, and mechanics so that the stuff would actually happen on screen and there would be no opticals involved the thing about Rob Bottin was that he was uh, uh, it was and is a genius, and he was really getting a chance to show off here. So I think he took it extremely seriously. Uh, and he's a perfectionist, which is a tough thing to be when you're in his profession because, you know, there's time and there's money, and, and that's, you only have so much of either one of them. Rob would be working upstairs over the stage, is what we were doing the inserts, and we would just hear reports, well, it's coming along now, it's going to be ready in about an hour and a half, you know, like a pizza. One day, in fact, we actually didn't shoot any film because we, it was the first day that Rob was going to do the transformation. They went upstairs to the makeup room and didn't come down. Lunchtime came and went. Dinner time came and went. Haven't shot anything. No, 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 it's not quite ready yet. Then he's finally ready. He comes down. He looks great. But unfortunately, everybody's got to go home because it's too late. And they're all on super golden overtime, even though it's a non-union movie. And we had to wait until the next day. I'd heard rumors about this, the, what was new about this makeup, the sort of bladder effect that they glued little airbags to your skin and then basically put a copy of your own skin, in other words, a, a, a latex mask that had been molded on your own face, over the little bags. Well, I didn't know that the bags would be condoms. You know, new ones, but, you know, condoms that had been glued here, 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 and a, and a giant was like a hot water bottle that was glued to my neck. But whenever they blew the tube that went into the bladder on my neck, completely closed my throat and I couldn't breathe. So when they blew on that, my eyes would bug out and suddenly I would stop dead and my body would start to convulse because I couldn't breathe anymore. And we had a few laughs when my shoulder got overinflated and exploded on camera. A little bladder goes a long way, we discovered. We were, we were bladder but wiser when we were finished. At a certain point in the transformation, we realized that we aren't going to be able to use the actor anymore. The face is going to become so unhuman that you've got to go to puppet heads. So Rob sculpted a whole bunch of heads that have all sorts of mechanics in them to change from human to monster. The trick comes in, well, how do you shoot such a thing? It's always better to move the camera if possible because that gives you a little more illusion of reality for something that isn't moving very much. Um, but also there's frame rates. The shot might start at 24 frames per second, which is normal speed, and as the action is progressing, we would maybe drop to 12 and speed it way up so it had an uncanny fastness about it, or as it drooled, we might go at a high speed, slow it down in slow motion, so the drool, the saliva would drool slower. It helped hide the fact that the rubber was uh, what it was. And a lot of these things, we, we would go to the point they would break, because the rubber had a limit, but nobody knew where it was till you broke it. Once we added sound to it, then things that were mistakes, where something that was supposed to go smoothly suddenly popped, or if you put a bone crack on it, it looked like it was on purpose. And in fact, it was better than having it just go smoothly. When it came time to do the werewolf transformations during the love scene, it was quite apparent that we weren't going to be able to afford to do that in any other way than animation, which suggests a little more obviously than I would have liked that they've actually turned into wolves. The uh, transformation at the end for Dee was uh, intended to not look like everybody else because she, being a, a good person who has been resisting the whole thing, uh, it wouldn't seem right to have her turn out to be a slavering, horrible creature like everybody else. But I did feel from the character's point of view that she should be different than, you know, a lot of the other werewolves. Rob came up with a kind of, um, I, it almost looks like a Pekingese um, kind of a werewolf. That was shot the day before the picture was printed, <laughs> the day before the prints were made, uh, in our office on El Centro. And it was like done at the last minute, and it was just put up against the wall and shot in a huge close-up. And 
That whole scene is done in huge close-ups because of the fact that there was no set. The design of the werewolves in this movie was lifted directly out of the research that we did. There were old woodcuts, they were, you know, like 16th century woodcuts that showed this wolf-like creature with a long snout and the big ears, but standing on its hind legs. So it kind of walked like a man, yet it had the backwards legs, and so it couldn't possibly be a man. You know, people are shaped a certain way, and wolves are not. Wolves have extremely skinny waists and these big haunches. So ultimately, we just ended up going with a real idea of what a huge wolf would look like if he was standing upright and, you know, could look you in the eye. You know, when we actually shot the howling, the werewolves were not finished. So we didn't even really know what it was going to look like, how big it was. Rob Boutin didn't have a lot of money to build all the werewolf stuff. So basically what he built is he built hands, and he built werewolf heads, and they look great, but they only went to here. And so that whole scene where she's killed by the werewolf was done rather perfunctorily, originally, with these werewolf heads and hands. And it, it proved to be somewhat limiting. And uh, we had to go back to Embassy and say, listen, if you give us a couple of more bucks, uh, we can probably do better than this. And we came back three months later to do all the interaction with the werewolf after it was finished. We actually were able to afford to build a suit, which was sometimes worn by an actor, and uh, other times would be just the legs. Although you never actually see the whole thing full length, you get the impression that this is an actual wolf with a, with a you know, very thin waist and these big legs. <laughs> In our grandiose dreams, we also had decided that we wanted to have some stop-motion werewolves since we knew that we couldn't build a suit that you could actually look at. So Dave Allen, who we had known for a long time, was a stop-motion guy, was one of the best in this field, designed us some uh, werewolves that would be seen in the barn and that the werewolves would, you know, you'd see them struggling and burning up in the barn. So he built a little barn set, and shot some werewolf stuff, and we looked at it and it looked pretty cool. But when we cut it into the movie, it didn't look like the rest of the picture and the movements were different, the lighting was a little different. We kept showing the rough cut to people and they go, what movie did that stuff come from? You know, how, where'd you get that footage? And it just wasn't, it just wasn't working in the movie and, it, it, and it, it was breaking everybody's heart but we just knew that we couldn't use it. But we did use a little piece of one shot of the werewolves baying at the moon at the very end, but even then we had to put it in the middle of a dissolve. In the script it said that when the wolves were running through the woods that they could actually fly. Rob came up with this concept which we used to call the rocket wolves. And the rocket wolves were uh, fiberglass werewolves which were finely detailed and looked terrific. Up its rear end it had a, uh, a tube and, and it went on this big air mortar thing. <laughs> it shot through the air. And the only problem was, which we, you couldn't see when you were shooting it, is that it left a contrail coming out of its rear end. So on film it looks like it's jet propelled literally out of its of its ass, you know, and, and we weren't able to use it. It was really a process of discovery for all of us.